Welcome to today's lecture. In this video, we will be taking a look at both platyhelminthes, our flatworms, and nematodes, or roundworms. So let's take a look first at this big long worm, platyhelminthes, the word platyhelminthes. So this word platyhelminthes literally means flat worms. And believe it or not, what we find in this phylum are our flatworms. And we have about 30,000 species of flatworms that we know of. So let's take a look at a few different kinds of these. Our first one is our turbolarians. Our turbolarians can live in the ocean, in fresh water, or in soil. And unlike the other flatworms that we'll see today, these ones are typically predators or scavengers. They are not parasites. And they all have a simple pair of eye spots, which they use to detect light and dark. They can't really see images, but they can sense light and dark. A couple of the ones that you may see in here, the first is our planaria, our brown planarian, which you may see in your lab. And the second, um, if you've seen Finding Nemo, you've seen a flatworm like this. And I think flatworms are an excellent example of a hydrostatic skeleton. So let's take a look. So you can see with our flatworm here, um, its whole body is rippling, its hydrostatic skeleton is really allowing it to bend and really move in an exceptionally fluid way. Another interesting thing with these turbolarians is their ability to regenerate lost tissues. Right? So turbolarian cells are what we call pluripotent, meaning that they can take, have many different fates within the body, kind of like some stem cells, and they can undifferentiate or lose their current structure and function and become new types of cells or new tissues. So how does this play out? The most common experiment you'll see is if you take a planaria and you cut it down the middle of its head, soon it will have two heads. Um, but what is even more interesting, if you take a planaria and cut it, for example, into seven pieces and give it a few weeks to grow, eventually you will have seven individual little flatworms. And you can tell they're individuals by looking for their eye spots. Right, so go ahead, count those seven flatworms. Um, scientists try to use these flatworms to understand things like aging and immortality, so they do get studied a whole lot. Another group of our flatworms are our trematodes. Our trematodes are commonly known as flukes. They are parasitic, and they have a complex life cycle, meaning that they need two different hosts to complete their life cycle. One example is schistosomiasis, sometimes called a liver fluke. The trematode is eaten by a human or a bird, and then the eggs come out of the humans or bird. Those are free swimming, then enter a snail, and from the snail, it mature, has, goes through a certain part of its maturity and then goes back into a human. So it alternates between a human and a snail as its hosts during its life cycle. Our last group of flatworms is our cestodes. These are our tapeworms. All right, these live in your intestines. They are also parasitic. So as they live in your intestine, they eat your food. A single tapeworm can be over 50 feet long. Um, so imagine that if your intestine was full of these and you get them from eating undercooked meat. The eggs are excreted in feces. Um, those can then be ingested. Um, by animals that are grazing on grass. It goes into the muscles where it creates a cyst, and then if we eat that undercooked meat, that cyst ends up kind of hatching in our intestines and attaching to our intestines. So for our flatworms, our symmetry is bilateral, and like we saw in that video, they have a wonderful hydrostatic skeleton. 
Now their digestive system is tri tricky because even though they're cephalized and have a head, you'll notice that they actually only have one opening for their digestive system and it's in the middle of their body. So they have an incomplete digestive system. Okay, um, They don't have a true circulatory system. They're not segmented. And for their nervous system, they've got a neural ganglia, which is a simple brain, and lateral nerve cords, which means the nerve cords that run down their sides. If we look at our cladogram, we would fit these platyhelminthes right here. And you'll see that what differentiates them from our cnidarians is, one, they've got bilateral symmetry, and they have, two, cephalization, or presence of a head. Let's move on now to our nematodes. This word nematoda means thread. Our nematodes are more commonly known as our roundworms. And there are about 15,000 species of roundworms. For their basic characteristics, their symmetry is bilateral. They too have a hydrostatic skeleton. If we look at their digestive system, you can see we now have a separate mouth and anus, which means we finally have a complete digestive system. They do not have a true circulatory system. They have no segmentation. And for their nervous system, they have a nerve ring up near their head. All right, so some examples of nematodes include these soil nematodes, which are actually very abundant typically in the soil and oftentimes will eat pests that would otherwise destroy crops um, or be nuisance insects. Um, we also have intestinal roundworms, which no surprise live in your intestines. This is a piece of a bowel that was removed from a patient um, because it was so full of intestinal roundworms. Another example is heartworms, which we frequently treat our pets for or preventatively treat them for. Um, heartworms are so dangerous because the hearts or because the worms literally mature in the vessels of the heart and in the um, arteries there, which means the heart gets clogged up and oxygen can't get to the body. So, despite all of this, the most famous nematode many high school students know about are the nematodes from SpongeBob. Um, now, SpongeBob is great. It was actually created by someone who is a marine biologist. However, there are, at times, inaccuracies, like the fact that SpongeBob is a kitchen sponge, not a sea sponge. Now, if we take a look at our nematodes, there's many things that they get correct. No eyes. They are cephalized. All right. Um, nematodes do eat a lot, but one thing they don't get correct these nematodes in SpongeBob are segmented, and we know that true nematodes are not segmented. If we come to our cladogram, we're going to put our nematodes right here. And we can see that, like our platyhelminthes, they have bilateral symmetry and cephalization. However, they have a body cavity, whereas the platyhelminthes do not. And specifically, our nematodes are pseudocoelomates, meaning they have a fluid-filled body cavity, but that body cavity is not lined with tissue. That is it for our platyhelminthes and nematodes. Go ahead and do part three, the planaria observations of your sponge, hydra, and planaria lab, and we'll see you back here for the next video.